<clears throat> yeah, thank you also for inviting me to uh, give this presentation here um, as, as part of the LINCS uh, webinar series on, on large-scale uh, research facility. I'm very pleased that I can introduce you to uh, the neutron scattering and imaging activities at the Swiss uh, spallation source, uh, SYNQ. Um, <clears throat> so I will um, uh, give you an overview of, uh, of our facility, talk a little bit about the instruments and also uh, discuss some recent highlights that illustrate the capabilities of our uh, instrumentation. Okay, so uh, the Paul Shannon Institute is in Switzerland. It's uh, in this location here, uh, it's close to Zurich. It's about 40 minutes by car from Zurich. Um, so it's in a, in a sort of hilly area north of the Swiss Alps. Um, it takes about 60 to 90 minutes uh, by public transport from Zurich airport. So it's very accessible. It's also a very historical area. Um, so five, six kilometers from here is uh, the town of, or used to be the town of Vindonissa, um, where the Romans had a big um, uh, camp. Um, uh, defending the northern flank towards uh, um, the German Germanic tribes. And a little bit to the west, about 10 kilometers from here, is the town of Habsburg, um, where there is still the Habsburg castle um, from where the uh, famous uh, Habsburg dynasty emerged uh, uh, many, many uh, um, uh, centuries ago. So here is an overview of uh, our uh, institute um, with, uh, you know, you see the mountains in the back, that's maybe 100 to 150 kilometers away, the mountains uh, on the horizon here. <clears throat> in the front, uh, you see an overview of, uh, of the Paul Chatter Institute. Um, it's separated by one of the largest rivers in Switzerland. It's called the Are. It's about 10 kilometers before it will join um, the Rhine further downstream. Um, so here, that's the eastern part here, and that's the western part. Um, and you see um, uh, the, the biggest facilities that we have at the Paul Scherer Institute also uh, already on this uh, bird side view. Uh, here on the western side, um, we have a muon um, facility, a user facility. Then we have SYNQ that I'm going to mostly talk about today. Then we have a synchrotron, uh, the Swiss light source. And the recent addition is a free electron laser Swiss file that is uh, here uh, on the eastern side in the woods um, uh, next to the river here. Um, so I should say that all these facilities are run as user facilities. Um, so we uh, operate them, we maintain them, we de develop them, um, and we um, make them available through peer review um, processes for users from academia uh, and also industry can uh, can use our facilities against payment. Um, so who who is the uh, whom is the uh, institute named after? It's named after Paul Scherer, <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, he was a Swiss uh, physicist. He studied physics and mathematics at ETH Zurich, afterwards in Königsberg and in Göttingen. He was a professor. Um, at ETH in Zurich from 1920 onwards, the director of the Physics Institute there from 1920, uh, 1927 onwards. And uh, he was uh, famous for the clarity of his lectures. Initially, he worked on X-ray scattering on crystals, liquid and gases, and uh, the Dubai shadow rings that most of you may know are partly named after him. Then later on, um, as it was uh, often the case at the time, um, he changed field. He worked in, in uh, nuclear physics. He became the president of the Swiss Study Commission on Atomic Energy. And he was also involved in the foundation of CERN. So he was uh, quite an important uh, physicist uh, in the first part of the 20th uh, century in Switzerland. So there's some numbers um, that you get, get a feeling for. Um, for how big we are and um, <clears throat> how we organize. So we have an overall staff number of 2,100, of which uh, 1,400 are, are um, financed by our internal um, steady funds, so to speak. 
then we have uh, 320 PhD students, 100 technical students. Uh, we have uh, many users that visit us every year, uh, almost 5,000 users, pre-pandemic, of course. Um, we publish about 1,400 uh, papers a year. And we also operate partly as a hospital. We have uh, almost 6,000 patient visits uh, per year that come to the PSI um, to get treated. I will talk about this briefly uh, later on. So in terms of research, um, here on the right hand side, you see a distribution of the main research areas. So the largest area is materials research. It's more than a third. Then life sciences, that's about a quarter of the, um, of the research um, activities at PSI. And then we have energy environment, 20%, nuclear energy and safety, 13%, particle physics, 8%. So here's some um, uh, examples of what kind of research we do on the left hand side. And there's the example of the development of new materials so for battery, uh, for batteries, or also studying such batteries in situ, in situ. Then on the top, you see the study of uh, a particle filter. We're using neutron tomography. One can study where the suit um, ends up in the, in, the, in the filter. And on the right hand side, you see, um, uh, you see uh, a transmission electron microscope. Uh, a picture um, also showing um, where the suit is. And here on the bottom, uh, you see an example of uh, our activities in, in the area of human health. Um, it's a study of the magnetic um, release um, of a medical agent that is encapsulated in a double walled lipid membrane. So in the area of energy in the environment, here are some, some um, other examples. Um, so uh, some people at PSI also study the, uh, uh, the efficient use of alternative energy, um, such as uh, the use of manure, algae, or waste wood um, uh, as energy carriers uh, and also for energy storage. And then <clears throat> um, there is one big division that uh, focuses on the security of nuclear power plants and uh, geological repositories. And uh, another division um, um, studies uh, the climate, it analyzes climate data and studies the environmental pollution. And here you see a picture of an outstation of the PSI. It's located at the Jungfrau Joch. Um, it's a very touristic spot. I think it's also called uh, uh, the top of Europe. There's a little train that goes up that was built uh, um, almost 100 years ago for the tourists and from which one sees the biggest glacier, the Aletsch glacier. Um, um, so that's the biggest glacier in, in, in the Alps. <clears throat> okay, in the area of human health, uh, so we cover a wide spectrum on one hand, uh, uh, PSI studies the structure and the functionality of uh, proteins. Um, then uh, we develop uh, radiopharmaceuticals for diagnostics, for diagnose, di diagnosing uh, tumors, for example. And we also uh, use protons to treat um, uh, um, people, uh, patients with, uh, um, with tumors. So they, um, and that's where, it's, where they were the almost 6,000 patient visits come from. So people come here um, to, to be treated with proton therapy. Um, so the proton uh, beam is, um, is, uh, is directed towards the area within the body of, of, of a patient where the tumor is located and with the energy um, and with the spot size, one can um, exactly map out the tumor inside um, the body without destroying as much tissue as would be the case with uh, X-ray um, therapy. So another important area um, um, at PSI is particle physics, um, uh, and uh, they also operate uh, a, a user facility that is called uh, CRISPS. It stands for Swiss Re Research Infrastructure for Particle Physics. And here are some three highlights of their research. Um, so, for example, they, uh, they study or search for charged lepton flavor violations, and, and they have, a, um, uh, they have a, uh, basically the, um, the best number for excluding uh, that the kind of um, processes are, um, are present. Then uh, they study um, the, uh, 
uh, radii of proton, the deutron and, and uh, helium, uh, three and four atoms, using laser spectroscopy of light uh, in muonic uh, atoms. And that is quite uh, an important result. Uh, then these results came out over the last 10 years, and basically they showed that the proton radius is slightly different from what was believed um, before these studies. <clears throat> and, uh, and the third um, uh, area here is uh, research that is done with a second uh, neutron source that we have here. At PSI, I'm not going to talk about that a lot. It's the ultra-cold neutron source. It's used for particle physics uh, only. And, uh, and the research that is done there is to search for time reversal and uh, CP violations by measuring the permanent neutron electric dipole uh, moment. Okay, so um, <clears throat> um, here is an overview of the large user facilities for materials research that we have at PSI. So we have, uh, we're very lucky to have four of such facilities at a single site. Um, it's unique worldwide um, to have uh, a muon, a neutron, a synchrotron, and a free electro electron laser source. And with uh, these three, uh, with these four um, uh, facilities, we mostly study um, materials. Here's a picture now of, of our uh, neutron facility that I'm going to focus on now. Um, here's a picture of the guide hall, uh, I think taken around 2014, 15. So before the upgrade that I'm going to talk about later. And the picture was taken uh, from this spot here and basically overlooks uh, many of our, uh, or basically all the instruments in our neutron uh, guide hall. So as you see, it's a very nice uh, space to work. Um, there's a lot of light. Um, it's easily accessible also from the outside. And, and as you see here, we also have many uh, young people um, that work uh, here and that makes the place uh, very uh, lively. Um, so we have about 20 instruments, as you can see down here, um, 15 of which uh, are usually in the user service. And then we have an additional five instruments that serve for testing purposes or are of purely in industrial uh, interest. <clears throat> Maybe I should also mention um, that we have uh, special uh, programs. So if someone wants to come and do a postdoc with us, uh, we have so-called so PSI fellows uh, uh, that, that can uh, come to PSI and that have uh, more uh, freedom than typical postdocs usually have. And we have a next deadline for such applications uh, in September uh, 2022, so one and a half years from now. Okay, so thank you, the neutron source, uh, it's an international user facility, it's nationally operated, but the, the user base is essentially international, and it can be accessed through a peer review, uh, peer reviewed access system. We have a science advisory committee that advises the management on how to operate the source and also selects the proposals. We have typically two calls per year. The next call will probably be November 15th. We just had a call uh, last week. Um, and in addition, we have uh, um, institutional uh, collaborations with the LLB in Sakle and with the Institute for Energy in Norway, uh, um, where, we, where they invest money here and in return um, get um, access time. And there will be um, additional beam time calls that are synchronized with hours for French and Norwegian uh, users. So access for industry is also possible against uh, payment. <clears throat> um, so uh, where we stand out is uh, that we have a high quality sample environment support. Um, and I think we are very student, PhD student friendly um, with a few in-house beamlines where people can really get hands-on experience um, with uh, neutron scattering. And in addition, we have an in-house engineering um, uh, unit with workshops and, uh, and the support that that makes uh, experiments um, often feasible that are not possible in other places. So uh, we underwent a major guide upgrade uh, in the last two years that gives uh, more flux and increase the performance of some instruments. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. Okay, I was asked to also say something about our operation during the pandemic. Um, 
So many users were not able to come to PSI, are still not able to come um, to PSI. Um, that makes it uh, rather difficult. At the moment, it's not possible to, uh, uh, to uh, perform the experiments completely remotely. Um, instruments are not um, auto automized uh, well enough and often when one does an experiment, one has to load a sample, wants to change samples and all of these things uh, make it that it's not really possible to uh, completely operate um, these instruments and, and, and perform experiments remotely. However, what, what we do is that we um, perform the experiments, some experiments, they proved experiments, they qualify um, for the users. So the users who, uh, uh, would send us the sample, they would discuss in advance in detail what kind of measurements um, um, uh, the users want to do. Um, and then the, the instrument contact, and that's of course a heavy, very heavy burden on them, and then perform the experiment um, in close contact um, with the users who are at their home institute. So um, medium and long term, we hope that all the users will come back um, <clears throat> and that we can welcome here again. Um, it's very important for a user facility such as ours that we can interact with users, that we can talk to them about the recent developments in science. And they can also, in return, learn about our new capabilities of our neutron instrumentation. And I think it's an important ingredient also for the success of an experiment that one has a daily, very close interaction uh, during uh, um, an experiment. So here's some statistics uh, um, about the use of SYNQ. Uh, so a little more than 50% of the time is uh, used by Swiss users. And then we have 12% um, uh, 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 German users. I think the uh, it's about one third uh, of the users come from Europe outside uh, Switzerland. And then we have 10% of the users that come from East Asian countries. And, uh, and then a few percent of the users come from, from the remaining uh, world. So the research that is done at SYNQ is very heavily focused on heart matter. About 50% of all the research that is done um, is in heart matter, the, uh, sort of historical reasons. Only 10% at the moment uh, is in soft matter. <clears throat> um, currently, we're trying to change this. Uh, uh, we reorganized the lab to reflect the importance um, of soft matter. Uh, and uh, we now have a soft matter group um, by grouping the people who work on that kind of issues and also by uh, hiring new staff and by having a col close collaboration now with the LLB in Sakle. So we hope that um, that no this number here uh, increases um, in, the, in the coming years. Then 5% of the research is done in the area of energy and environment, uh, five additional percent in engineering and applied research. 5% in, in the remaining um, research areas and about a quarter of the time is used to develop our instrumentation, improve it, maintain it, and also to uh, organize practicals for, uh, for students. So down here you see how the number of users has developed over the years. So in red, that's the uh, number of individual users that we uh, welcome every year, it's about 500. It was pretty stable here, apart from uh, this year, where, where the, the facility only ran um, half of the time, half the length uh, that it usually runs. And of course, in 2020, uh, we had a very low number because of the uh, pandemic. I mentioned it briefly before, uh, in, the early, in, in the slide before, uh, we organized university practicals also. Um, and here is a practical that we organized a few years ago. And we do this for a number of universities, Swiss universities, um, ETH, EPFL, University of Basel, also University of Zurich in the future, and also for some foreign universities like the Niels Bohr Institute and the Technical University of Denmark. And we've done, we've organized one also for, uh, for Sweetness a few years ago. <clears throat> Of increasing importance is the use, industrial use of SYNQ. Here on the right hand side, on top, you see the number of uh, projects, industrial projects that, uh, that we were able to acquire um, throughout the years. And you see basically that the three year average 
points clearly upwards. So we have uh, at least a doubling of, of industrial projects over the last seven, eight years. We still uh, we, we think uh, there's still a, a huge potential in that area. Um, for some projects, uh, the use of neutrons is absolutely essential. For example, we have one project with uh, Dasso Aviation that provides pyrotechnical components for the Ariane 5 and Vega rockets. And uh, they rely on neutrons to, um, um, to check whether their pyroelectric elements are um, according to specification. And only after these studies are done, um, these elements can, can be installed um, at the rockets uh, and the launch can be prepared. Um, so um, we would like to increase industrial use further. Uh, and two years ago, um, we founded a public-private partnership for the use of PSI large facilities by industry. It's called ANAXAM, stands for Analytics with Neutrons and X-rays for Advanced Manufacturing. Here is the website if you're curious. We also now have an, have an English, um, um, uh, uh, English version of, of this website if you're curious to, to look around. Um, so in terms of numbers here, for example, in 2020, where we only ran for half uh, for half the year, um, we had about 15% of the beam time on the instruments that, that have industrial uses, the imaging beam lines or one of the uh, reflectometers. Um, we had about 15% of the, of, of the time that was used for, um, um, for industrial use. Okay, taking a step back, um, <clears throat> how do we get the neutrons? So we have a proton accelerator. Um, uh, and, these, uh, and, and this proton accelerator accelerates the protons to very high energies. Does this through several stages. We have a Cockcroft-Walton accelerator here that accelerates the protons to uh, 72 mega electron volt, then an injector, sort of a pre-accelerator um, that accelerates the uh, protons to 272 mega electron volts. And then finally, uh, no, it's to 72 mega electron volts. And then finally, uh, the main cyclotron here, uh, where the protons are accelerated to 590 mega electron volts. Uh, this proton beam is then directed um, in this direction. Here, here are two targets where muons mostly are produced for particle physics and materials research. And the remaining of the beam, that's about 70%, is then directed here onto the uh, SYNQ target. So that's about one megawatt of of protons that hit the uh, SYNQ target at that stage. Um, the ring synchrotron, cyclotron is quite old. It was uh, built almost uh, uh, 50 years ago, 1972. It's called HIPAA now, uh, with all the other uh, um, accelerators. Um, and here you see a picture of 1972 um, with uh, eight magnets here and the four um, RF um, um, components that accelerate the protons. <clears throat> so initially, um, um, the ring cyclotron was built for a power of 50 to 100 kilowatt, so uh, much less than, than it's operated at now. Um, and here's a picture of 2010, so essentially looks uh, uh, very similar still, but we have now many more people that uh, work at the um, at the cyclotron. And here you see um, <clears throat> why that is the case. So uh, the cyclotron was uh, operated uh, between 50 and 100 kilowatts uh, for, uh, uh, for about 10 years, up to 1990. And then um, because SYNQ was planned, the power of the cyclotron was then ramped up um, a factor of 10. And in 1997, um, SYNQ was then able to go into operation um, with um, with a power of about one megawatt. Here's a CNQ target station. So the, the, the proton beam is directed from below onto the target. It hits the a heavy metal target here. And so we have a large cooling unit that has to cool one megawatt of, of power that is deposited here. And here you also see then um, how the CNQ target station is built up. So here's the target. Here we have beam ports. Um, here we have uh, a cold source um, where the neutrons are uh, moderated and then taken out through these guides towards the uh, uh, cold neutron instruments. 
it's a top view. Um, so here's the target. Uh, then we have uh, heavy water in here. We have light water as a reflector so that the neutrons get moderated, can spend some time in here to lose the energy. They have a very high energy when they get produced because uh, they're produced by a spallation process. So that stage, some of these neutrons have mega electron um, uh, um, energies. And what we need are neutrons that are at, a, at, at milli, uh, milli electron uh, energy. So that's many orders of magnitude lower in energy. And, and, that, and, and, and to achieve that, we basically moderate them in a bath of, uh, of heavy water first, and then for the, in the cold source, uh, in a bath of uh, deuterium, cooled uh, deuterium. So we have two water scatterers for thermal instruments that are located in these directions here, and we have a cold source um, from which these instruments along these, this direction are being served with neutrons. So you know you see um, the overview with all these instruments. So the target is here. So this is um, these are the instruments that see thermal neutrons uh, in the east and west directions and in the uh, north and south directions, uh, these instruments see uh, cold neutrons. <clears throat> so um, the spectrum of, of uh, uh, that, that these instruments see, so for the thermal instruments, uh, it's basically max value and distribution of, of energies that peaks roughly uh, at, at 1.5 angstroms or 30 milli electron volt. And for the cold instruments, it's at about four angstroms and five milli electron volts. Uh, so the neutron guides at Syncu, they have been quite old. They were installed in 1993-94. Syncu was the first neutron source that used super mirror guides um, um, to guide the neutrons towards the instruments. <clears throat> that was very crucial uh, because uh, that allowed to increase the flux. So basically um, um, save as much phase space of the neutrons um, um, and deliver that to the to the neutron scattering instruments. So the super mirrors that were built, uh, that were um, uh, installed at the time, were of nickel titanium type. They were all made at the PSI seventy two bilayers. Um, they were very relatively simple, but state of the art at the time, and had rectangular shapes of thirty five to uh, one hundred twenty millimeters. Uh, in the last uh, thirty years, however, there has been a lot of development and. So these M equal to two uh, super mirrors that were state of the art uh, back in 1993 um, are now greatly surpassed by, by uh, M equal to four, five, or even six uh, super mirrors. And that allows to transport a much larger phase space uh, to uh, those instruments that can use the, uh, that kind of uh, beam. In addition, there are also completely novel guide systems developed uh, since the mid nineties. Uh, there's one example of an elliptical guide. Uh, here's a test that we did together with, uh, I think, Swiss Neutronics at the time, um, of an elliptical uh, um, guide. And that basically has the advantage that fewer uh, reflections are needed, ideally only one, uh, to transport the neutron from the source to the sample. And that basically allows that the flux that can be transported to the uh, sample position is uh, is higher for such a uh, such a complex guide system. So all this um, <clears throat> uh, motivated us to think about an upgrade of of SYNC, in particular the guide system. Um, and uh, the motivation, finally, uh, the scientific motivation was was as follows. So these days, many people want to study small samples, um, sort of this of the size of one um, millimeter cube. Um, often these samples are inside complex sample environments, um, so they require that the reduction of unwanted scattering is important near the sample position. Um, then um, the use of novel beam optics um, uh, offers new uh, uh, possibilities to focus on small spots, for example, or to avoid um, the scattering of neutrons at sample environment. Then we also put some effort in re reducing the fast neutron background that comes directly from the source. And at the same time, um, we wanted to build uh, or rebuild uh, three instruments and upgrade them. <clears throat> and so with this, uh, um, I think our facility is going to be uh, 
uh, in a position to play an important role um, in, in the current uh, research landscape for the next uh, 10 years or more. So with a relatively limited budget of 20 uh, million uh, Swiss francs, I think it's about 15 million euros, 15.5 million euros at the moment. So compared to uh, uh, you know, the budgets uh, for instruments at, at ESS, for example, um, was a relatively modest uh, budget to uh, upgrade an entire facility. And here are some uh, impressions uh, of the SYNQ upgrade. So we, it was executed in 2019, where we didn't have any uh, neutron beam. And in the first half of 2020, and you see here that we removed all the neutron guides um, <clears throat> in the neutron guide hall. This is the neutron bunker here um, that is usually closed. And here is uh, the area where we have the neutron guides usually and the neutron instruments. And you see the neutron guides were removed, all the instruments were removed. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, um, we uh, um, uh, were upgrading some of the instruments. Um, so it was a very tight schedule, but uh, uh, nevertheless, we were able uh, to remain almost on time. We had a two months delay due to the pandemic and were able to go back into operation um, in July 2020 and were able to offer neutrons to our user community uh, from September 2020 onwards, so for four months. Uh, <clears throat> and we then, uh, as we do every year, uh, we have a shutdown in uh, January, February and March, and we're now back into operation for more than a month now um, and have users, uh, if they can come back on site or we perform experiments uh, for them. So here uh, is the flux upgrade um, that we were able to achieve. So we had some instruments. So first I should say there was a flux increase in all instruments in the guide hall, at least a factor of uh, nearly two. Those instruments um, that obtained uh, complex um, uh, neutron guides, novel uh, guides, uh, they have a much higher um, gain factor, for example, armor uh, that uh, can profit from a from a focusing guide over 30 meters. And um, also uh, Kamiya has an increase of the factor of six because it has an elliptic guide that uh, focuses the beam or will focus the beam then on, on, the, on, a, on a focusing monochromatic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in addition, uh, we're building now um, sounds LLB at this position here. There was a different instruments before. And because we uh, um, are um, increasing the diversion slightly, we're using an M equal to two um, guide here for the sounds instrument that may be useful for some experiments. We're also able to increase the flux um, by a factor of nine for this instrument compared to the flux uh, of the old sounds, sounds two instrument that um, sounds LLB is replacing. Okay, so here's an, uh, the map now of the SYNQ instrumentation after the upgrade. <coughs> so we basically for diffraction have a single crystal diffractometer thermal. Uh, we have a powder diffractometer uh, HRBT and we have a cold neutron um, diffractometer that uh, can serve both as a single crystal and uh, a powder diffractometer. Then for neutron spectroscopy, we have uh, Kamea. We have a triple axis. Uh, 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 spectrometer TOSP and with a thermal uh, triple axis spectrometer Eiger. TOSP is the uh, cold. Um, small angle scattering, there we have uh, two sounds machines and a reflectometer. At imaging, we have uh, uh, Neutra, Icon, and BOA that we can use to about 50% for the user's uh, service. And we also have a thermal uh, engineering uh, diffractometer. So, I mentioned before, we are very strong in sample environment um, at low temperatures, cryogenic uh, uh, um, sample environment. Um, so we have a whole range of, of the cryostats, uh, uh, magnets. Uh, we have three horizontal magnets, four vertical magnets. We have several dilution fridges. And basically that reflects um, the importance of hard matter um, uh, at, at SYNQ. So we say, say to this, uh, so uh, as part of the reorganization of the lab, 
and uh, and uh, with an increased focus on soft matter, um, we have now also started a number of um, uh, projects where we try to improve the sample environment for uh, a soft matter. Uh, for example, rheometers, humidity chambers, uh, um, uh, solid liquid cells for reflectometry, etc. <clears throat> Okay, so now here a, a few words about uh, some of these new instrument concepts. So, um, so one thing that we uh, finished already before the upgrade, but whose full potential we can only take advantage of now after the guide was also upgrade, upgraded is Kamea. It's a new concept where the scattered neutrons um, are analyzed um, uh, for their uh, energy in a wide range of scattering angles, 60 degrees and for uh, six different um, uh, or eight different uh, energies. <clears throat> and that basically uh, makes it possible to uh, measure much more efficiently than that was possible um, for a, a triple axis where one had to measure every such point individually. So we hope that through this um, uh, concept here, uh, our um, um, neutron spectroscopy measurements will be much uh, faster. <clears throat> Then another uh, highlight in terms of instrumentation, and that was uh, uh, something that was invented uh, uh, here at SYNQ, is the new reflectometer, uh, AMOR, <clears throat> that basically allows to combine uh, angle dispersive and energy dispersive measurements because of the use of a, of a focusing um, optics um, that has a, must have a very high accuracy <clears throat> that allows to uh, direct um, um, the beam on a very small area. <clears throat> um, so this uh, uh, distance here is about 30 meters here, and uh, it's possible to, uh, or the goal at least was to, to uh, focus the beam um, onto about one millimeter, uh, uh, or two, three millimeters cross section. <clears throat> and you see here, the, that's the, a picture of that, um, of that neutron optics, uh, one segment of, of, of uh, those 30 meters. Here you see the demonstration that indeed uh, one can um, uh, focus um, the beam and can basically map uh, um, the source that is one times three uh, millimeters squared onto a spot of equal size after these uh, 30, meters, uh, 30 meters. Quite impressive. And then after the two meters after the focal point, you see now that the beam is now larger again. And here are some test measurements. I think that's a measurement of a nickel titanium um, super mirror. And this was before the neutron upgrade, neutron guide upgrade. And in, in gray and in red, that's after the neutron guide upgrade. And you see, uh, so this, this is a measurement that was done 10 times faster here in red. And you see you get better data in 10 times less uh, measuring time. So this is a technique that works uh, uh, very well for specular reflection does not work for uh, measurements that uh, require the measurement of off-specular uh, reflectometry. So here, uh, there's something that we're still building up. We will commission this uh, later this year in October. Um, it's basically the, uh, a complete uh, rebuild of uh, the DMC instrument. Uh, we'll get a, a new sample table that is completely non-magnetic uh, and a large detector. Uh, the cover is 132 in angle and uh, vertically uh, 15 degrees uh, a total, so 7.5 degrees up and down. And so uh, here, uh, this instrument will be excellent to study uh, magnetic structures, um, powders, but also uh, single crystals. So one can easily map then um, order parameters. One can look for order parameters um, if one doesn't know where they occur in uh, reciprocal space. And finally, um, one other big project is the replacement of SANS-2 with the SANS-LB. Um, so that's an instrument, instrument that was relatively new, uh, was built up at the LLB. Uh, because of their shutdown, uh, we were able to, to get that instrument. <clears throat> so it's a modern long SANS instrument, 20 meter tank. Um, so we have on that instrument, uh, higher neutron flux now of at least six to seven times higher. I think in the other slide I had nine, not sure. Uh, I think it's somewhere in between probably. Um, and uh, so we uh, we hope that we can go into user operation with instrument with this instrument in the spring uh, 2022. 
So further upgrades. So we have a few instruments that are relatively old. <clears throat> and among those are our imaging instruments and also our engineering diffraction instrument, Boldy. And so what you would like to do uh, uh, from 2022 to 24 is upgrade these two instruments. So uh, the thermal imaging uh, neutral instrument uh, we'd like to uh, change so that it's more flexible so that we can access different uh, locations along the beam um, to choose a high flux or a high resolution uh, position if required to, to put uh, samples to have basically more space for for putting the samples at the appropriate uh, position and we'll also like to uh, have more space for an in-situ x-ray diffraction setup that can be used uh, simultaneously for poldi um, uh, we're we're now purchasing a, 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 a new detector system, and there will be two of of, of identical tech detectors, uh, left and right, that will make the uh, measurements uh, much more efficient. Plus, we will install uh, vertical focusing optics that will increase the neutron flux twofold. Okay, so now in the last uh, seven eight minutes, a few uh, scientific uh, examples. Um, so here is a, a very topical uh, example. Um, it's the study of unusual spin textures. So they're of very high interest um, at the moment. Um, and skirmions uh, in particular, because they have certain topological properties that makes them very stable, sort of similar to what you, what you see here. Um, <clears throat> and the question is essentially how, what kind of materials can uh, sustain such uh, 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 skirmions, skirmion phases, um, and what are the mechanisms? And here's a study um, that of this material here um, that demonstrated that there are at least two um, skirmion phases in this mat material. And there is uh, this disordered skirmion phase in this part of the phase space where um, basically the, the, the skirmion lattice is not ordered and where the skirmions uh, uh, arise um, from frustrated magnetic interactions. That's one of the sort of things that people are looking for in, in that area, uh, because it would mean that the skirmions um, are, are relatively small and and uh, and the uh, uh, um, and that would would be an advantage to increase the data storage if, if one uses skirmions to to save uh, uh, data. Um, <clears throat> here's another example of novel. Uh, spin textures and how they could be uh, interesting for applications at some stage in the future. Um, so it's a study of the uh, magnetism in this material here. And what we've seen here is uh, that this material um, uh, has this kind of structure in, in part of the phase space that has these uh, meron and anti-meron uh, type uh, spin textures. <clears throat> at the same time, it was observed that the um, uh, uh, that the um, um, trans electron transport properties show a uh, topological Hall effect. And that basically uh, makes this an example of, uh, of sort of a, a wild semi-metal where the mag magnetism uh, can affect the electron band structure. The proposal is essentially that the, these whale points are separated spatially um, in this material. Then another important topic is uh, the study of uh, materials that uh, uh, don't order at all. Um, in particular, if they have a low spin, um, so the, the options are that they kind of, if they have a low spin, um, so options from theory of materials can undergo its length and start a pyroclo system with a relatively low spin here, um, where the excitations were measured. So that's the diffuse scattering at uh, close to the elastic line. And here, and these are CDR um, that are uh, interpreted as, uh, as coming from a continuum of scattering. Um, that could be fractional excitations living on, on a, in a, in a quantum spin liquid. Okay, given the time, I think I'll skip some of these. So here is uh, our first uh, published paper from Kamea. It was a study by uh, Kim Leftman and his group. Uh, he studied this material here as a triangular system that orders, but at the same time curiously shows um, a very low energy excitations here. Uh, something that also is often observed in systems that are believed to be quantum critical. 
and and this paper argues that uh, um, this can be uh, explained with critical scattering alone and it raises the question whether some of the results in, in some of the other materials should maybe also be interpreted as uh, critical scattering. So here is a, a, an, uh, an example from soft matter, self-healing of microgels. Um, so microgels, um, they can um, avoid formation of defects upon crystallization because they can change their size, but it was not really understood why that is the case. And this is a study that was done by Urs Gosser and his group. He did a neutron scattering study that showed uh, that counter ion clouds, they can um, uh, percolate. And because of the percolation, um, that basically then has a strong enough effect to change the size of one of these particles. And that leads to, um, to this flexibility in forming um, a structure in these uh, microgels. So this is the last uh, um, example. So it's the study of uh, pseudo-boiling of supercritical water. <clears throat> so what was studied here is the liquid gas transition in supercritical uh, water that was predicted by theory um, and it's served, observed by some systems, but not uh, uh, for water. So uh, using neutron and icon, it was possible to observe uh, this transition directly. You basically see here, so this is a pressure cell heated up to a specific temperature. And as the temperatures increase, the contrast changes here. And that basically reflects the change from a water, um, uh, sort of a, a liquid heavy uh, phase into a, um, uh, into a gas uh, uh, dominant phase. And then more recently, this was studied in more detail, basically shows that, um, that there is a more liquid phase that is separated by a gas-like phase, by, uh, by the so-called Widom line uh, that was uh, predicted uh, um, uh, um, theoretically. <clears throat> okay, so um, that's just the last highlight uh, um, about the development of imaging techniques. Um, so a lot is going on in that area, particularly here at the PSI. We've been leading that area for, for, for 10, 15 years. And here's just some, some highlights. Um, that basically shows that with uh, grating interferometry imaging, one can tune to what kind of length scales one is sensitive to. Um, one can also do uh, three-dimensional dark field imaging, um, so do, do tomography with a quite reasonable um, <clears throat> um, resolution, for, at least for, for neutrons. And uh, there's also a development now to use uh, two d gratings to, to do such studies. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, that was a, the sh a short overview um, um, of our activities here at uh, SYNC. I hope I was able to show you that we have uh, quite a diverse portfolio of, of activities, uh, capabilities. Hopefully some of them are interesting uh, to you. And you would of course be very happy if we can welcome you uh, sometime in the future um, as a user. Uh, so before I finish, uh, if you have more information, you can go to this uh, link here. And uh, I'd like to thank, of course, all the people who make all this work possible. That's the staff, mostly of uh, LNS and Lynn staff, and of course, all the other staff at, at PSI. And also uh, the users, of course. So, so we wouldn't be uh, in such a strong position with our, without our uh, excellent users. So, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Michael, for a nice presentation. Thanks so much. And uh, we have uh, some general question to start with. First is uh, how <clears throat> for the postdoc uh, fellowship, how can one approach uh, for this uh, program? Is it uh, uh, do they have to contact the supervisor or find a host there? Yeah, so the next call is in 2022, in the fall. Um, so typically in about one year time, there would be a call. Uh, there will be a list of projects um, that, um, to put the camera over here. There will be a, li a list of projects that will be published with the mentors. And, uh, and, and the people who are interested would then contact these mentors uh, and uh, work out uh, an application uh, together. Ah. That's the usual process, yeah. Nice, thank you. Then yeah. we have a, a couple of uh, uh, more technical questions. And uh, this one is, 
how uh, is it possible to measure the green size uh, in a magnetic material or do you suggest some uh, beam line, some instrument to do that green size measurement in uh, magnetic materials? Um, so I think that would be the just structural grains, not not magnetic grains, and so to speak. No. Um, yes, that's possible. Uh, we can do this. Uh, we can do a uh, basically three D tomography, and I didn't show that we have one such example where one can um, basically map that out three uh, yeah. D. I forget now what the resolution was, uh, spatial resolution was. Uh, yeah, but I think it was on the order of I don't remember uh, one hundred microns or below. Uh, Okay. I would, have to, I would have to check it up. Uh, yeah. uh, it would be nice for the audience also if they can uh, if uh, uh, they can contact you directly for yeah. this question. Okay. Yeah. There's another one with uh, the electrochemical part. Is is it uh, possible to do the measurement on uh, the electrical uh, bilayer in in batteries, for example? Um, yes, so we've done such measurements. Uh, that, so if it's, uh, let's say, uh, sort of on the surface, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, sort of a bilayer that, that is flat, then uh, um, one could do that with reflectometry and such measurements have been done. And one, one is highly sensitive, of course, if you want as a lithium ion battery to the, the presence of lithium. Yes. And so that's, that's the, these are kinds of the kind of measurements that we've done uh, on our uh, reflectometer armor. 